welcome and good afternoon. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you to this public conversation that's convened by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. This is School of Public Affairs for the University of Minnesota. Um, I'm a professor at the uh, university at the Humphrey School and we've been holding public events uh, for many years and since March, of course, we've been doing it through Zoom and now you can carry it on a podcast. So if you'd like to uh, follow up or share this uh, program, feel free to. One of our traditions here at the uh, Humphrey School and the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance is to encourage your participation. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A button. Give us your questions, give us hard questions, give us questions that disagree with what we're talking about and what our guest is presenting. That makes this program better. I'm greatly honored to have with us former Vice President Walter Mondale, who's been, uh, we've been partners in teaching class and doing public events of this sort for many years now. And it's a great honor to have you with us, Mr. Mondale. And I'd also like to welcome our guest. Um, and I have to tell you, this is maybe the only guest we've had back so many times, um, Mr. Tom Hamburger. Um, Mr. Hamburger is, has an illustrious career. He started off with a uh, bachelor's degree at Oberlin College in Ohio. He then worked at the Arkansas Gazette starting in 1976 where he got an early look at Bill Clinton and what Bill Clinton was about. Uh, he then moved to the Minneapolis Star Tribune where he worked both in the Twin Cities and then moved to Washington where he has now spent his career for a number of decades. In Washington, he worked at the Wall Street Journal. He worked at the LA Times and since 2012, he's been working at the Washington Post uh, conducting extraordinary investigations. One of the things about Tom and those who follow him is how extraordinary his reporting is. He's won many awards and I'm not gonna go through them except to tell you he's won the Pulitzer twice. Um, and he's won other uh, very exclusive awards in recognition of that um, talent. One of the things I admire most about Tom is the depth of his research. research. He is someone who genuinely looks at a variety of perspectives and possibilities. And you'll see that today. And if you're someone who thinks that Bill Barr, our topic today, is evil, or if you think he's been victimized as a patriotic American, give us questions, because I think you'll find that almost every perspective has been thought through by our guest, Tom Hamburger. He's also a good and generous friend to the Humphrey School, the University of Minnesota, and to me personally. And so it's a great honor to have Tom Hamburger with us. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Mr. Mondale, I was wondering if we could start with you um, and, uh, and have you kind of describe the role of the Department of Justice, which you work with quite closely in the six, 1960s, 70s, 80s, and of course have followed their work um, since. What was the Department of Justice What's its tradition and values? The Justice Department sits at the center of our national system of law enforcement bearing on constitutional rights. So it couldn't be at a more central spot uh, than it is, and it's and involved in more appropriate uh, discussions of what is important. Tom Hamburger, of course, uh, knows all about it. Tom and I started back in uh, the prehistoric days in- Plasticine so, era. So, <laughs> and I, I came to really admire him. And uh, I am so glad that he could uh, make this trip back uh, with us. Uh, you're in Washington most of the time now. I am, yes. Okay, well, yeah. I wish I wish I was more often in Minnesota. Yeah, well, come on out. <laughs> we we can solve that. 
you can solve though i understand what you're doing and now you're in the middle of this we're all in the middle of this uh, uh attorney general Barr question and i think you're doing work on that too it's it's a it strikes me as strange that this guy who really got his start with uh, the Bushes, considered, uh, again, I think a moderate back then, should suddenly reappear as this uh, very right-wing uh, champion of, um, of of his, uh, his, he'll describe this shortly, but it's it's a um, a rejection of of what I think we need to have a responsible, careful system of justice in our society, and he's 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 had a bad start, I'd say. And he seems no, in no rush to get over that. And um, so we're hoping that uh, Tom will talk to us about him, what he thinks he's doing, and what, what we should be doing as citizens to deal with that challenge. Tom? Well, thank, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Mondale. Great to be it's an honor to be uh, um, with, with you and also an honor to be with uh, at, at the Humphrey Institute and uh, with Larry. And uh, my only regret is that I'm with you virtually and not actually in Minnesota. Um, I, uh, DC? I'm are in you DC. In yes, sir. I'm in DC and uh, we are puzzling, as you just uh, suggested, um, at, at the Washington Post, uh, like the rest of the country about what's going on at the Justice Department and who this guy is, Bill Barr. What makes him tick? Um, there was such uh, lofty expectations for him, as, as, as you will recall, when he was uh, nominated and confirmed in 2019 to be the Attorney General. He'd replaced uh, 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 acting Attorney General Mark Whitaker, who was, um, uh, who was uh, obviously underqualified and was making people in the department uh, and across the country somewhat disconcerted. Jeff Sessions had preceded him in a rocky tenure as attorney general and the Mueller report was being finished up. So here was a guy, as Mr. Mondale just said, he'd worked for George H.W. Bush, was close to him. He had uh, uh, backed uh, initially Jeb Bush in the 2016 campaign. He received um, laudatory words from back then, Joe Biden. Uh, there were people who regarded him, of course, as a, as a, as a hard um, uh, and, and serious conservative, but also as an institutionalist. And he took the oath of office and very quickly began to dismay some of those, um, particularly the Democrats who had provide provided warm words and expectations that in, as an institutionalist and remember that he was a longtime friend and colleague of, of Robert Mueller's. So Robert Mueller's completing this very um, uh, significant report. The nation is waiting to, to, to understand what it will say. Mueller's already been denounced in effect by the president. And now we have an attorney general who we think of as an institutionalist, a friend of Mueller's who's on board to um, basically serve to usher in uh, this report. And um, so there were enormous expectations for William Barr. And I would say among um, uh, people uh, on the left and among Democrats particularly, but also among a surprising number of very serious conservatives with whom my colleagues and I have talked at the Washington Post in the course of of, of, of looking at Attorney General Barr, there was a sense of dismay, a surprise that in fact, he was um, perceived as not representing fairly the Mueller report when it was first introduced. You'll recall that he did produce a four page summary of the report a couple of weeks before it was released publicly. And that ended up 
providing the, um, the headlines and the public view in advance of the full report's release. Um, he didn't use these words at all. He, he, he said that, the, um, uh, that there was not a finding of uh, collusion. He did acknowledge that, that Bob Mueller had determined that there, um, uh, had, had determined, uh, uh, said he could, he could not exonerate the president on uh, his behavior when it came to obstruction of justice. But his four page summary, once it was released, led the president in his, one of his famous tweets to say, in all caps, total exoneration. Um, <laughs> and, and, and Barr was in a sense um, viewed by um, some of Mueller's allies, some on his team, and by many people observing this, as kind of enabling the president's um, uh, exaggerated uh, uh, tweet version of the Mueller report. And that was probably the, um, uh, 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 the first sign of concern or even alarm, if you will, about whether the Justice Department would continue, Mr. Mondale, in the tradition that you talked about of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a department that represents um, uh, that, that, that's a guardian of the law and represents the people and the Constitution. One of the questions is now, is this Attorney General the lawyer for the President, president of the United States? And is he, as the title for this talk suggests, weaponizing the department on behalf of the President? I, I, rem I remember um, sitting with uh, then President Carter as we discussed how we could approach the attorney general's office and um, try to get a better result. And we decided you can't. You got you gotta let the Justice Department do its do its thing and then take take over from there. So he, 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 Barr has been slamming into some very deep traditions here. So, Mr. Mondale, in the course of doing my uh, working on this profile, which will appear in the Washington Post, I believe, in the next uh, few days, um, we did some research on, on previous administrations and came across the very conversation you're talking about when Griffin Bell was the Attorney General. Yes, that's right. And Griffin Bell uh, followed um, Ed Levy, who was considered a great re post-Watergate reformer. And there was a little bit of nervousness as I read the history books, Mr. Mondale, about Griffin Bell because he was, a he was from Georgia and a friend of Jimmy Carter's. And so right. there was initially some concern there might be some backsliding towards a Watergate era of the Justice Department being close to the White House and representing White House or the president's interests as opposed to the people's interest. But I gather that was quickly dispelled. <laughs> Got over that. Well, it, 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 we ended up in the right spot. I'm so I, I, I read that um, Griffin Bell had a, one of the things he noticed shortly after taking office, one of his aides rushed in and said, uh, uh, the White House is calling. And he, he said in his Southern accent, well, buildings don't call, but people do. And he set up a process in the Department of Justice so that if there were calls from the White House, and of course there needs to be communication, there is a dual role for the Attorney General, but he wanted either the Attorney General or the Deputy Attorney General to handle those calls and did not want the White House exerting political influence over what he Griffin Bell called the nonpartisan neutral zone of the Justice Department. Tom, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if I could direct you to um, some of the reporting you've done and others about why it is that uh, you or um, conservative and, and liberals see uh, the attorney general as uh, weaponizing the Department of Justice? What's the case for that claim? Yes, um, uh, let, me, let me make the, 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 let me explain that claim and why it's out there. I think it's a pattern um, in which there is these critics claim a um, series of events and actions by the Attorney General, which have supported the President's private personal agenda, the President's political agenda, supported the President's allies, and caused harm or asserted Justice Department action against the President's 
political enemies. Here are the quick examples, if I can just run through them. The number one and at the top of the list, and perhaps the most memorable in the national psyche is the Mueller report, where William Barr was perceived as providing a summary of that report ahead of its public release that was very helpful to the, to the president. Um, in the, the, the next example we might look at is this suggestion that the, that the Attorney General has acted personally on behalf of the President's friends. You'll recall that the Attorney General in his personally reviewed and asked for a review of the conviction of um, General Michael Flynn. And, um, and then essentially at his decision dropped that case because he thought it was compromised. General Flynn, as we know, was a, a close um, uh, uh, a campaign surrogate for Donald Trump and that Donald Trump was concerned about his welfare, even talked to him about Jim Comey. Here comes the Vice President of the United, the Attorney General of the United States doing this extraordinary, um, providing this extraordinary decision. And it's, it's uh, our, our Justice Department sources say a situation like this in which a case has been completed, guilty plea accepted, to have it, the Attorney General come in and basically undo the case and throw it out is unheard of, unprecedented. Another unprecedented action was in the case of um, Roger Stone. Roger Stone is as, as you all remember, was a close uh, friend and kind of a, a dirty trickster who helped uh, D Donald Trump. And um, he was convicted. And the prosecutors in that case recommended a sentence um, after consulting the sentencing guidelines and sent it to the court for consideration. The attorney general intervened and said this session, the sentence is too harsh and asked that the sentence be um, a cutback almost in half. Another benefit to a president's friend, Roger Stone. Um, quickly to turn to the other side, there are presidential critics who have infuriated the president. Michael Cohen, when he announced that he was writing a book, um, which, is, which has come out just in the last uh, 10 days or so, um, uh, was, was out on a, on a COVID uh, 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 health uh, release from prison. The day he announced he was doing the book, he suddenly slammed back into solitary by the Bureau of Prisons. The Attorney General says he had nothing uh, to do with this decision, but the judge who released Michael Cohen less than a week later said this was an extraordinary violation of, of, of First Amendment rights, and it appeared to be done um, um, with, with, with partisan intent. Um, the, can I just mention one more, Larry, and that's John Bolton and his extraordinary book about his time inside the uh, White House serving as national security advisor to the president. The Justice Department not only sought to, uh, went, went to court um, fighting Bolton and his ability to profit from the books, but also saw something that's quite extraordinary, a temporary restraining order to stop publication, stop distribution of this book. Again, a presidential enemy, a presidential critic who had infuriated Donald Trump, the Justice Department being used to attempt to, to, to stop distribution of his book Thus, the claim weaponizing the Department of Justice on behalf of the president. Um, you've used the word perceived weaponizing of the Department of Justice. And yet, you've just gone through a series of cases that are quite real. What's going on? Why, why don't you just call it as it is and just say, the Attorney General is weaponizing the Department of Justice? What's your hesitance? So, so Larry, we have uh, this is a. <laughs> this is this is a discussion I've been having uh, uh, with editors, in fact, in, 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 in advance of this piece. There is a pattern, and it has struck people as quite extraordinary. And not just it struck Vice President Mondale, but also two um, currently serving um, federal judges. Uh, Reggie Walton excoriated the, vice, the, the Attorney General for seeming to politicize the department. So yes, there are these, the, these patterns. What we found in diving into it is that in many of the cases, including those that I've just mentioned, there are responses which one might, which, which deserve consideration. Um, there is also our effort to understand the um, thinking of William Barr, who is in fact, and there are cases we can cite, where he has separated from uh, uh, the President of the United States, and we can talk about some of those examples as well. So there's something extraordinary going on at the, at the Justice Department, and a perception that it is aligned with the President and his political and personal interests in a way 
correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mondale, but in a way not seen since John Mitchell and the Watergate era. John Mitchell, who was basically a, 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 a campaign manager for the president, became the attorney general. And then with, 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 with not even with the uh, guise of, of, of attempting to be objective, um, uh, really was the president's, um, uh, uh, acting as the president's lawyer. Yes. So, Manuel, do you want to remind us about uh, uh, the attorney general and the work he did, uh, John Mitchell? Well, yes. Uh, John Mitchell was um, um, Nixon's right-hand guy. He was um, supposed to be the attorney general, but he was more or less Nixon's hatchet man. And um, he um, spent his time over in the Justice Department trying to protect the president and those around and to clean up, quote, clean up the record so that the president wasn't in any, in any problem whatsoever. I wouldn't say that's the way it ended up, but that's, that's what they were trying to do. Um, I, I didn't know Mitchell very well, but strangely, after he and I were both out of office, I, I ran into him over in uh, South Washington, where you guys are practicing. And we had a long talk about what he was doing and why he was doing it. I would just say I didn't come away more encouraged than when I started the conversation. But he, he was... Um, he was now out, now out of public life and um, looking for friends, I guess. And Mr. Mondale, if, if my memory serves, I believe he's the only attorney general in the history of that office who was uh, convicted of a, of, a, of a crime and served time in jail after serving as attorney general. I believe you're right. There's a candidate around here now, but I mean, uh, yes, he was the only one at the time we were having that conversation. Tom, could you walk us through uh, some of these extenuating or counter uh, evidence to why uh, Bill Barr is not, um, you know, in your view, uh, someone who clearly has evidence of, of practicing uh, favoritism for the president? Um, because you've only given us one side and I, probably a lot of people are wondering, well, what yes. is this that you find so... Um, you know, uh, 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 it leaves you to be uh, pausing. Why are you pausing? Give us the evidence. <laughs> okay, Larry. Well, um, th let me um, uh, start by um, saying it's a, uh, maybe, maybe it's a journalistic quality. And I've also had the opportunity to spend time in just the last few weeks with the Attorney General himself, with some of his um, uh, clo uh, 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 friends and 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 backers, um, veterans of the Justice Department who admire his judgment and what he's doing, and it does strike me, um, especially in these polarized times, that it's important, as it's always been important for 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 reporters and news organizations to get the other side of the story. Sure. But I'm going to before doing the answering that question, I didn't quite get to finish my list of the extraordinary things that are happening, which fill out the pattern. Because it's wait, 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 wait. Let's let's not go on to the pattern. Let's because I think right now there's there are a number of us who are just confused. Why are you hesitating? I see. So um, one of the things that I'll tell you is that um, uh, um, William Barr maintains um, is. So what, one of the questions we attempted to ask was, has he changed? Did something happen to him given all these expectations? What we've learned is he was always a very hard conservative. When he served in the Justice Department in the, in the first uh, uh, George H.W. Bush administration, the Office of Legal Counsel, he wrote opinions that, about presidential power that were considered so extreme that his successor in, in, in that office, um, uh, um, uh, Walter Dellinger 
um, said it was his top priority to write a superseding opinion about one that William Barr had written saying that Congress was encroaching on presidential prerogatives. Huge believer in the, in, in the power of the presidency. Second, we learned that he is, um, uh, has very, very strong religious views. These religious views have translated even while he's been attorney general, not very well known that we focus on it in our stories. He has a very strong view of America's moral decline and believes that the attorney general and that public officials have a role in expressing that publicly. Third, related to police powers, the Justice Department, traditional role of the FBI, he has very strong views. So Larry, when we asked him, and, and Mr. Mondo, when we asked him, what would you like your, at the top of your obituary to say was your greatest accomplishment? His answer was saving black lives. And then he turned into a recitation of the project that has really preoccupied him as Attorney General, um, Operation Legend, which serves um, uh, in about nine um, uh, urban neighborhoods that have had a, a trying to tamp down a, a hu huge surges of violent crime there. Um, so, so my answer in part, Larry, is that in getting to know this guy, I viewed him as a um, serious thinker, a, a, a very um, hardcore conservative um, with, with very strong views, way views that used to be considered, in, in, in the words of, um, of Walter Dellinger, um, the de uh, uh, Bill Clinton's uh, Justice Department appointee, they said that they're the most conservative of anyone he knows in who's uh, of stature in the law among Republicans. But nonetheless, um, those are beliefs. You have presented uh, two stories here. One is the sympathetic view of Barr and what his motivation is from, from within Bill Barr's head as a unitary presidency guy and a hard uh, conservative moralist. The other part is you've given us a story about documented cases in which the attorney general's behavior has violated clear Department of Justice norms and rules uh, to the point and you haven't mentioned this yet, there have been a number of prosecutors and longtime Department of Justice lawyers who have quit because of him, who have stepped down from cases because of his instructions. Uh, and now you have an extraordinary case in the Michael Flynn Review, where you've got a former judge who's come out and said that Barr's behavior was corrupt and politically motivated. So to be honest, I think a lot of us are willing to put aside what Bill Barr is saying and say, let's talk about his behavior. Is his behavior weaponizing the Department of Justice? Well, there's a, there's a, 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 case, a strong case to be made, Larry, and we haven't yet discussed the two matters that are actually most alarming to people as we approach um, the presidential election. Um, one of the, re you talked about the resignations, three different cases, prosecutors resigned just last week one of the prosecutors who is assisting John Durham in this extraordinary probe of, uh, uh, of alleged uh, surveillance and spying abuses um, uh, that supposedly occurred in the Obama administration um, um, resigned. Um, she did not explain uh, the reason for resignation, but her friends have told the Hartford Current that uh, it was over concern that Bill Barr was pressing in, improperly in her view for a pre-election report on this alleged um, uh, misconduct by the Obama administration, which would involve Joe Biden. And the second of great concern okay. are Bill Barr's co yeah. comments about the vote. About, about voting in the mail-in ballot in which he has backed up the president by um, suggesting that um, mail-in voting is subject to fraud and coercion and even suggested without any evidence that there could be um, foreign, foreign uh, agents counterfeiting ballots in certain states and distributing them. It is undermining the public's faith in the election. And these are two urgent matters that have really driven this concern, I would say, to new heights. Okay, so coming back to my question, uh, you have now presented an extent, you know, you extended your, your, what's that, Mr. Mondo? I said, we're having a problem with the, you, the tag along. 
Yeah, I mean, what, 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 help us understand why you're not pulling the trigger. I see. On Bill Barr, You've, I've read your reporting for a very long time, and you're a guy who is a truth speaker. And I understand and appreciate your commitment to fairness and presenting why Bill Barr might see his behavior as, as um, appropriate. But there is a world out here. There are laws. There are Department of Justice rules, procedures, uh, and common practices. And, you know, there are nonpartisan people who are looking at what Bill Barr is doing in the Flynn case. Now you've got Durham. Now you've got the issues around the election or just find his behavior to be, um, you know, just extraordinary. Yes. And we, and part of my job, Larry, is journalist. So you're asking a question to a journalist who views it as his responsibility to interview everybody and try to understand what's going on and represent all points of view. Um, but the 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 pattern that we've laid out, I would agree, is um, is, is is very strong. And uh, I wanted to tell you also, in the course of our work, we talked with prominent Republican veterans of the of the Justice. Department. Um, uh, Stu Stuart Gerson, Mr. Mondale, you may remember, was George H.W. Bush's direct head of the civil division, meaning the chief litigator for the, for the U.S. in all civil cases. And then after Bill Clinton's election, he became acting AG until Janet Reno was sworn in. Um, but he is a staunch conservative and develop, describes himself that way. And he answered our questions very forthrightly. We said, did Bill Barr change? Did something happen to him? He said, I've known Bill Barr. I worked with him in the Bush administration in the 90s. He has not changed one bit. What's changed is, is the, um, that he's working for a president who is not George H.W. Bush, who was an institutionalist. Um, he's working for a president that allows him and his philosophical beliefs in a powerful presidency, perhaps beliefs in morality and in the role of law enforcement um, um, uh, to, to um, run uh, kind of unchecked in a way that wouldn't have happened and that didn't happen in the Bush administration. And he cites his familiarity with Barr's views going back that far as someone who has extreme views. Um, there's another former um, uh, Justice Department a veteran, Donald Ayer, a Republican who served with Bill Barr in the Justice Department, who said he thinks Bill Barr's views are authoritarian. Um, and that what is being weaponized here is not a department on behalf of Donald Trump necessarily, but on behalf of William Barr's long held views. We have a lot of questions here. Mr. Bono, did you want to jump in? I just wanted to say that has to be uh, part of the story and I don't, don't hear it yet. P part of the story meaning the, the weaponizing of the department, is that what you said? The, um, the uh, characterization of Barr. Yes, so you will find in our story, which um, uh, uh, um, uh, I hope will be uh, uh, published uh, uh, shortly, um, that those views are, um, are, are very much apparent and the pattern is also uh, laid, laid out here. Um, what we attempted to do also was sort of answer the question of who this guy is, whether he had changed somehow, and what motivates him. Tom, we've Is got a great question. Story? I'm sorry? Will that be in the upcoming story? Yes. Well, if the editors permit, <laughs> I expect yeah. that it will, yeah. Well, they permit. Uh, Tom, we've got a number of terrific questions here. Here's one from Jeffrey Arnold. You've gone into great length detailing actions by Mr. Barr that are perceived to be supporting President Trump. What about those events when he acted contrary to the president? Please discuss those. Okay, th thanks for the question. And that is one of the, uh, the things that, that, that we also will note in our story. So um, for example, in the Roger Stone case, which is cited um, by the prosecutors who quit and in the public mind is one of the strong examples of William Barr um, favoring a presidential friend by reducing his sentence. There's a little, a, a less covered aspect of what Bill Barr said in that case, which is that the prosecution of Roger Stone, he thought was righteous and appropriate. He also thought Roger Stone should serve time in jail. He just disagreed with, with the sentence. 
And, um, and third, um, he, he called it righteous and an appropriate case and that he should, should serve time in jail. And then he was undermined by, these, by the president who he's so aligned with, who then commuted um, Stone's sentence and said that he didn't, that the case was, was, uh, uh, was inappropriate, the opposite of righteous. So the two um, uh, were in conflict um, on that case. Um, there are other examples. We studied some, the Mueller, uh, and, and are not writing about it in great depth in this piece, so it interested me, to go through the whole timeline of the Mueller case. And um, Barr, in his four-page summary, to his credit, did acknowledge that Mueller said he could not determine um, uh, uh, whether, um, uh, could not exonerate the president and his conduct. Um, he, he also provided summaries that were very useful to the president but not the same. He didn't say, and the president said, total exoneration. Barr actually said the opposite. Um, Mr. Mondale, you actually have a connection to Bill Barr's trajectory. And here's what it is. You ran the domestic side of the famous church committee, which investigated our intelligence agencies and the FBI. Um, and you dug up the case of the FBI's uh, persecution of Dr. Martin Luther King for exercising his rights as a citizen. And folks who don't know about the church committee and Mr. Mondale's role in that should read about it because it's one of those seminal events in the past half century that many of us who are concerned about government accountability and the constitution know about it. On the church committee included people like Barry Goldwater, Howard Baker, now, these are rock solid conservatives and Republicans and it stands out. In any case, Mr. Mondale, the, the um, follow on on the church committee, the creating a FISA, then congressional efforts to create intelligence committees um, and, and other steps led Mr. Barr to believe that Congress was inappropriately infringing on the president's power and that the president's power ought to be um, uh, free of a lot of the uh, encumbrances that, frankly, you and, and your colleagues created. Did, did, he, did he make that point while we were working on the church committee? Well, he had, while you were working on the church committee, he was assigned by George H.W. Bush, then the head of the CIA, to be a sort of a congressional liaison for the agency. And he personally monitored the church, uh, the ch church com com committee activities and the Pike Committee, which I believe was going on simultaneously. Yeah. And he had primary responsibility for Pike. Um, and I think that there was um, uh, the concern that Larry's expressing, um, and certainly it is part of Bill Barr's uh, record. And the record is very public and. And, um, and, 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 and deeply argued that um, presidential, uh, great wariness of presidential, uh, uh, any restrictions on presidential authority. Wow. I don't think that's very well known yet. Uh, he, he has uh, um, uh, 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 played a role in a number of the sort of, um, uh, uh, a famous uh, uh, a landmark um, actions in the history of uh, of, uh, uh, of um, intelligence agencies and um, actions overseas. He wrote for George H. W. Bush the uh, uh, legal opinion um, that helped uh, justify the U.S. invasion of Panama, which was conducted really to arrest Manuel Noriega at the time when when when. William Barr was last Attorney General, and uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot. Well, I learned, learned a lot doing this, but there was a there was a moment where he was called before Congress to explain his decision making, and he didn't release his full opinion at the time. He said, "Let me summarize it," and afterwards, the Judiciary Committee hey. who was doing it said he didn't release the the entire uh, version. He really misstated it in his summary. And uh, Harold Coe, who was in the Clinton administration um, and the Obama administration and, and, and was a, a, a 
former head of uh, the Dean of Yale Law School, said when he saw Barr do this, back in the case of the Noriega example, he said, I saw then his signature moves, um, uh, which in addition to having these well thought out views, there was a quality of being deceptive or being um, uh, sort of undermining congressional questioning of the activities of the executive branch. Tom, Tom we've got a bunch of questions here where, and time is of course ticking away. I wanna uh, pose one uh, from a former colleague of yours, Sharon Schmickel, who notes your, um, the point you made about Bill Barr's concern about America's moral decline. Her question is this, does Bill Barr have to square that with Donald Trump's personal behavior? I should have expected that Sharon Schmeichel would ask the best question. What an honor it was to work with Sharon at the Star Tribune. And um, uh, so, so glad to get that question. Yes, of course, it was one of our fundamental questions. How can a guy who is uh, the Attorney General, who gives these speeches that are really, in effect, moralizing, it's, he laments in these speeches, one at Notre Dame just a few months ago, um, uh, 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 um, the moral decline of America, the slipping into licentiousness, and, and, um, um, and, and he's so strong and even fervent in these views. How is it, we asked him, that he could work with Donald Trump? Um, I asked at one point in our interview if he thought he was amoral. And the response that he gave, which you'll see in our story, is that all, all people are flawed um, and that no one is perfect. Um, so I would say we get uh, uh, the clearest answer to one of the things um, um, that, that, that Sharon's very, very good question raises, which is this obvious conflict between uh, someone who is not only serious about his views of executive power, but very serious about his Catholic conservative views and the moral decline. How could he work for, represent, serve as a top officer in an administration led by a guy whose behavior would seem to be, um, um, from, 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 from all of the public record, to be one of um, amoralism, and that might be putting it kindly. Uh, Tom, a question from Jack Jensel. Is Bill Barr a continuation of Barack Obama's wingman, Attorney General Eric Holder? So the um, Bill Barr um, defenders who we talked to all cite Eric Holder's um, description of um, himself as Barack Obama's wingman saying, this is what attorneys general do. And they even bring up some of the examples in our conversations that I mentioned in response to the previous question, earlier question, that Barr has disagreed some and, and even publicly with the, with the president on a couple of matters, on a few matters. Um, the, the, um, I don't believe that there is a, a comparison between what's happening in the Justice Department today under Holder or any of the recent attorneys general that Mr. Mondale spoke about, starting with Ed Levy and then Griffin Bell. It's the entire post-Watergate cast has really um, established traditions and norms in the Justice Department, which we see being breached or forgotten um, now on, it seems, almost a daily basis. Tom Hamburger, you have spent... I was sorry. on the church committee when Ed Levy was testifying. He's a remarkable, he was a remarkable attorney general. I, I was going to mention, Mr. Mondale, that in the Attorney General's conference room, Attorney General Barr has placed the um, paintings of the Attorney General he most admires. On one wall is uh, Ed Meese, who is one of the early um, advocates of this unitary executive theory. Um, but across from him is Ed Levy. Um, and uh, he told us that uh, Ed Levy is one of the um, uh, is, is one of those uh, uh, that he also uh, 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 greatly admires and, and a small, uh, this interesting footnote of history that Larry brought up earlier, Attorney General Levy's grandson is now the chief of staff to, to William Barr. For those of you who don't know this history, 
we're going back to the church committee again in the mid 1970s. And uh, Ed Levy was the attorney general then was remarkably uh, and perhaps surprisingly cooperative with the church committee in, in, um, in working through the issues they were raising, talking about reforms. Uh, this was not a partisan issue as we see it today. It was very much, uh, let's get to the bottom of the problem and make sure that the constitution is being followed. And so what Tom Hamburger and, and Vice President Monda are doing is just showing the links uh, between the church committee report and Ed Levy um, to today. Um, yeah with an attorney general that's very different from Ed Levy. Tom Hamburg, I wanna ask you about a preoccupation of yours over the last number of years, which was the, 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 the connections between the Trump campaign and Russia. And you've written a lot of stories about this. We now have the Mueller report. We've got the um, Justice Department's um, uh, inv investigator general um, Horowitz, who came out and said there were a lot of activities here. It was imperfect, but there's no doubt that there was efforts uh, by Russia to influence the campaign and the election to favor Donald Trump. Now, just in the last month, the U.S. Senate has released a, a monstrous report of almost a thousand pages which goes into great detail about the nature of those relationships and the Russian view of some of the folks in the Trump campaign in 2016 as easy marks of, uh, to move them to helping their agenda. So now we've got Bill Barr, who's been consistently trying to put a break and derail that investigation, as we saw with the Mueller report, um, a press release that he prepared. Now he's got this U.S. attorney from Connecticut, John Durham, who's geared up to release a report probably shortly before the election that is alleged to uh, finally name names about the conspiracy against the Trump campaign in 2016. Tell us what you know about Barr's involvement in that and, um, and how serious that is. So, uh, um... Larry, just to go to the first part of your question, there has been an extraordinary um, post Mueller report release of information, including maybe the most significant for, I think for American citizens in these polarized times was the report of the Senate Intelligence Committee that you spoke about. A thousand pages and embraced by the Republicans and Democrats, a bipartisan group on that Intelligence Committee who did describe in disconcerting detail, the ways in which the Kremlin um, uh, was um, um, moving to and seeking um, interactions and influence with the Trump campaign. It was actually a much more forceful report and convincing, I thought, than the Mueller report itself and it, it initially, which was, it, it was better, 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 risen, better written and arguably because they didn't have to bring a criminal case, um, um, uh, be, better argued. Um, your, your question was about Bill Barr's motivation related to the Russian investigation. It goes back to something we learned from talking with him and his staff that Mr. Mondale brought up. He was, remember, in his early years in Washington, the CIA liaison to the Pike Committee, following the activities of the Pike Committee, which was a parallel to what Mr. Mondale and the Senate was doing with the Church Committee. And he claims then that he became wary of the powers of the um, of, of uh, surveillance and of the intelligence apparatus, both intelligence agencies and the FBI, to surveil American citizens. And in discussions, and he's been quite limited in talking about it, Larry. So we have to, to you know, mostly what I'm describing, uh, all of what I'm describing, is really what's been on the public record. His concern in the Durham investigation is not directed to undermining the notion that Russians may have attempted to interfere in 2016, um, although that, that, that could be part of it, because he's looking at the origins of that inquiry. But what he talked about and his staff talked about uh, um, is the concern that there was improper surveillance of a political candidate and even a victorious presidential candidate. 
And so is raising some questions, and I, 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 I'm very interested in what you and Mr. Mondale think of this, that the agencies overstepped their, um, uh, the, some of the legal boundaries that I think Mr. Mondale helped, helped write into law, including the FISA process. And so I wondered, um, um, uh, that's part of, of his point of view in pursuing this Durham recommendation is to, on behalf of the American public, he, he says, weigh in or, or um, assess whether the intelligence agencies and the FBI acted appropriately in a very um, a carefully monitored aspect of their work. Tom, Tom the, the reporting in the papers, and uh, none of it is, I guess, hard because there's not been much, but no information um, of great substance released by the uh, prosecutor, John Durham. Correct. But the impression is that Durham is going to be uh, indicting uh, or presenting a narrative in which very senior members of the Department of Justice and the FBI, including possibly John Comey, um, I've heard John Brennan's name mentioned, who used to be the head of the CIA, that they're going after big names as a kind of October surprise. Isn't that the issue? Why is, why is that the kind of the, the direction this is going? I think institutional reform, Mr. Mondale and I would be two thumbs up on that. It's absolutely needed and it's not a, frankly, it's not a partisan issue, but why is Barr pushing for this October surprise? Isn't that another example of this pattern of weaponizing the Department of Justice to benefit President Trump? Um, again, the, um, Larry, the timing has become the key issue. There is a rule honored by all of the attorneys general we were talking about from Ed Levy on um, um, that, 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 that the attorney general and the department should steer clear of actions that could influence an election. This rule of forbearance uh, um, there is in the um, uh, U.S. Attorney's Manual. It's been widely accepted, and it has now been challenged by, the, the, by this attorney general. And recall also, I just wanted to, to remind all the listeners that it's not just the attorney general who's pursuing this John Durham investigation. You have the extraordinary situation now of the president of the United States writing about the writing about the, the investigation and setting expectations for his base that, as you said, Larry, there may be indictments, um, and also writing it, this, this odd note, if you recall it a few weeks ago, a tweet to William Barr saying, if you want to go down in history, um, uh, you'll make the right decision when it comes to announcing the Durham findings, um, a very unsubtle form of pressure by the president on his attorney general. What, what, tell me a little bit about this Connecticut um, prosecutor. prosecutor. What's going on there? I, I, don't, I don't remember hearing much about him until the last four months or so. Well, sh well um, first, in, in answer to your, the first part of your question, John Durham is a, um, a, a decades-long veteran, very much admired U.S. attorney from Connecticut, who has before received special assignments from the Justice Department, including doing a report and investigation on uh, um, Guantanamo and, uh, in another case, corruption in a very high-profile criminal investigation. He's known as a straight arrow, a very tough investigator, and a guy who takes the time that's necessary to prove difficult cases. He came into the news, um, uh, uh, Mr. Mondale, shortly after uh, uh, the, the, the Attorney General repeated a, a word used by the President, spying suggesting that spying might have gone on in his campaign um, uh, improperly uh, undertaken by Obama administration officials. Attorney General Barr then announced um, that he was naming in, in uh, mid-2019 John Durham to investigate what he called the origins of the Russia inquiry, including this question of whether there was inappropriate surveillance. And since that time um, in 2019, John Durham has been engaged in what we understand to be quite a wide ranging effort. It's back in the news now with this question of whether he will um, indict or release a report before the election. And um, Democrats are crying foul. 
they're crying this is a October surprise. They have appealed to John Durham and his tradition and history in the Justice Department. Um, he's had several letters from uh, Fred Wertheimer, who is one of the founders of Common Cause, saying, Mr. Durham, you've got such a great reputation. Remember the Justice Department rules about election interference. Durham is, does not talk to reporters. We don't know, Mr. Mondale, as you said, much about what he is doing, what he's found. But we do know that just last week, his top deputy, or considered his most senior deputy, resigned. And the reporting from the um, a Connecticut paper where they're based is that she resigned because of what she felt was undue political pressure from the attorney general to release a report before the election, something which she believed was wrong. We don't know for sure her reasons for resigning, but we have been able to determine, and my papers reported this, that there are tensions between Durham's office and Barr's office on timing. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, Mr. Mondi, I wanted to mention that as part of the uh, story on Russia that Tom Hamburger has been talking about, the Department of Justice Investigator General Horowitz has reported that the FISA process has 17 uh, documented cases in the Russia investigation of omissions and other violations of process. And what I would say is you and I have been talking about that for 15 years or more with regards to Presidents Bush and Obama. We've had in folks from various departments in the government, including and um, advocates in the ACLU and others who have also talked about the uh, flaws in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act process that allows warranted spying. Um, so there is, I don't know, silver lining is the right word, but it's interesting that Barr's behavior, which is clearly being seen as partisan by some, has elicited this reaction that may well lead in future years to needed reforms of the uh, warranting process for electronic surveillance. Thank you very much. That's, that's very trouble ahead. Yeah. Tom, we're, we're just about out of time. Do you want the last word? Well, I, I would just, uh, uh, if it's the last word, I would just say, uh, check out our story in the Washington Post. And I think we're coming up to a very dramatic moment um, in this uh, election. And we're seeing something extraordinary, which is the Justice Department uh, a top officer undermining confidence in, uh, in mail-in voting. That's the thing to watch, I would say. Uh, just hold on a second. Your paper come out, this issue we're talking about. Well, we're writing about it, of course, almost daily and have um, a special uh, uh, watch features on election integrity. Um, our story on Bill Barr will, will be out, I think, in the next uh, a few days. Um, and um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But it, uh, it's now in the hands of editors, as we say. OK. Just hold on there. I want to just make a few announcements. Uh, if you like this program, we've got some terrific programs coming up. Uh, we've got a series of programs related to the election. Uh, one is on Latino voting with Mark Lopez, who's a renowned researcher of Latino political behavior. This will be terrific. It's going to be moderated by my colleague and political sci science professor, Michael Minta. Uh, we're gonna have a conversation with Al Franken about the 2020 elections. Al is always scintillating and provocative and we're gonna go back and forth. So come to that, we'll have lots of good questions for uh, uh, Senator Franken. We'll also have a program in about a month's time on uh, women and the elections. Uh, those of you who, um, uh, I've been following our programs. Remember back in May, we had Jennifer Lawless come. She's premier scholar of women and voting. She'll be back. And my colleague in political science, Catherine Pearson, will be moderating that. That's October 7th. All these programs um, are available when they're done, as with today's program, in a day or so. It's available both on YouTube as Zoom, and we're now doing podcasts so you can uh, listen to them if you'd like to follow us that way. Uh, all the programming here is um, uh, stems from the fact that we have the resources to do it. If you'd like to contribute to this kind of
programming, please help us. Um, I want to give a couple thank yous. First, I want to start with uh, my good friend and colleague, Kate Samino. She is the watchdog and, and executive producer of our events and a leader of our policy fellows program and so much more. This is Kate's last day. She will become the executive director of the Citizens League. Thank you very much, Kate, for all of your great work with us. I'd also like to thank Mike Curry, who did the hard work of lining up today's speakers and arranging this event and so many others. Thank you, Mike. And most importantly, I wanna thank today's guests. Uh, Tom Hamburger, you are a genius and I'm grateful for your candor and your, your hard work in, uh, in really doing the necessary reporting uh, without taking it in the partisan direction. Uh, very important, continue to follow Tom Hamburger. He's, he's really the guy to keep an eye on. Vice President Mondale, it's always a pleasure to be with you. The last 15 years have been a uh, highlight of my academic career. Thank you very, very much. I'd like to join in your recommendation. Um, we've been separated for a couple of years here. I haven't realized that he's, got, he's still got his curveball. He does. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, uh, it's such an honor to be, uh, to, to, to be with you. Great to see you, Mr. Mondale, Larry, and to uh, participate in this uh, uh, Humphrey Institute uh, Forum. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you. We'll see you next time.